Satan is not a product of later church theology. But then what does this saying tell us about Jesus' self-concept? It reveals that he thought of himself as the exclusive and absolute Son of God and the only revelation of God the Father to mankind. Make no mistake, if Jesus was not who he said he was, then he was crazier than Jim Jones and David Koresh put together. Finally, I want to consider one more saying. Jesus saying on the date of his second coming, as recorded in Mark 13, 32. He said, but of that day or that hour, no man knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. This is an authentic saying of the historical Jesus because the later church, which regarded Jesus as divine, would never have invented a saying attributing limited knowledge or ignorance to Jesus. But here Jesus says he doesn't know the time of his return. But what do we learn from this saying? It not only reveals Jesus' consciousness of being the one Son of God, but it presents us with an ascending scale from men to the angels to the Son to the Father, a scale on which Jesus transcends not only every human being, but even every angelic being in his proximity to the Father. This is really incredible stuff, and yet this is what the historical Jesus believed. And this is only one facet of Jesus' self-understanding. C.S. Lewis was right when he said, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. Number two, Jesus' miracles. Even the most skeptical critics today cannot deny that the historical Jesus carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. Rudolf Bultmann, who was one of the most radical, skeptical scholars of the 20th century, wrote back in 1926, most of the miracle stories contained in the Gospels are legendary, or at least are dressed up with legends. But, he said, but there can be no doubt that Jesus did such deeds, which were, in his and his contemporaries' understanding, miracles. That is, deeds that were the result of supernatural, divine causality. Doubtless, he healed the sick and cast out demons. This from one of the most skeptical New Testament critics of the 20th century. Back in Boltmann's day, the miracle stories were thought to be influenced by stories of mythological heroes in pagan uh, religions, and hence, in, it part, in part at least, legendary. But today it is widely recognized that the hypothesis of mythological influence was simply historically incorrect. Craig Evans, who is a well-known uh, historical Jesus scholar, says that the older notion that the miracle stories were the product of mythological divine man ideas has been largely abandoned. He said it is no longer seriously contested that miracles played a role in Jesus' ministry. The only reason left for denying that Jesus performed literal miracles is the presupposition of anti-supernaturalism, which is not a historical consideration, but rather a philosophical position which is independent of the evidence. Number three. Jesus' trial and crucifixion. According to the Gospels, Jesus was condemned by the Jewish high court on the charge of blasphemy 
and then delivered to the Romans for execution for the treasonous act of setting himself up as the king of the Jews. Not only are these facts confirmed by independent biblical sources like Paul and the Acts of the Apostles, but they are also confirmed by extra-biblical sources. From Josephus and Tacitus, we learn that Jesus was crucified by Roman authority under the sentence of Pontius Pilate. From Josephus and the Syrian writer Mara Bar Serapion, we learn that Jewish leaders made a formal accusation against Jesus and participated in the events leading up to his crucifixion. And from the Babylonian Talmud, Sanhedrin 43a, we learn the Jewish involvement in the trial was explained as a proper undertaking against a heretic. According to Luke Johnson, the support for the mode of his death, its agents, and perhaps its co-agents is overwhelming. Jesus faced a trial before his death was condemned and executed by crucifixion. The crucifixion of Jesus is recognized even by the radical critics in the so-called Jesus Seminar as being the one indisputable fact about Jesus. But that raises the very puzzling question, why was Jesus crucified? As we've seen, the evidence indicates that his crucifixion was instigated by his blasphemous claims, which to the Romans would come across as treasonous. That's why he was crucified in the words of the plaque nailed to the cross above his head as the king of the Jews. But if Jesus was just a peasant cynic philosopher, just a liberal social gadfly, then his crucifixion becomes inexplicable. As Professor Leander Keck of Yale has written, the idea that this Jewish cynic and his dozen hippies with his demeanor and aphorisms was a serious threat to society sounds more like a conceit of alienated academics than sound historical judgment. The New Testament scholar John Meyer is equally direct. He says, such a Jesus would threaten no one, just as the university professors who create him threaten no one. Skeptical critics have thus created a Jesus who is incompatible with the one indisputable fact about him, namely his crucifixion. Finally, number four, Jesus' resurrection. Now, most people would say that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just believe in by faith or not. But in fact, there are four established facts recognized by the majority of critics who have written on this subject, which I believe are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Fact number one, after his crucifixion, Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb. This fact is highly significant because it means that the location of Jesus' tomb was known in Jerusalem to Jew and Christian alike. In that case, it becomes inexplicable how belief in his resurrection could arise and flourish in the face of a tomb containing his corpse. According to the late John A.T. Robinson of Cambridge University, the burial of Jesus in the tomb is one of the earliest and best attested facts about Jesus. Fact number two, on the Sunday morning following the crucifixion, the tomb of Jesus was found empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist in this area, and I quote, by far most exegetes hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements concerning the empty tomb. As D. H. Van Dalen has pointed out, it is extremely difficult to object to the empty tomb on historical grounds. Those who deny it, he says, do so on the basis of theological or philosophical assumptions. Fact number three, on multiple occasions, and under various circumstances, 
different individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive from the dead. This is a fact that is almost universally acknowledged among New Testament critics today. Even Gert Ludemann, the uh, most prominent current uh, critic of the resurrection, admits, and I quote, it may be taken as historically certain, those are his words, not mine, as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ, end quote. Finally, fact number four. The original disciples suddenly believed that Jesus was risen from the dead despite their having every predisposition to the contrary. Despite their having every predisposition to the opposite, it is an undeniable fact of history that the original disciples came to believe in, proclaimed, and were willing to go to their deaths for the fact of Jesus' resurrection. C.F.D. Mole of Cambridge University concludes that we have here a belief which nothing in terms of prior historical influences can account for apart from the resurrection itself. Any responsible historian then who seeks to give an account of the matter must deal with these four independently established facts. The burial of Jesus in the tomb, the discovery of his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the very origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection, and hence of Christianity itself. And I want to emphasize that these four facts represent the conclusions not of conservative scholars, but of the wide majority of New Testament scholarship today. The question then is, how do you best explain these facts? Well, here the skeptical critic faces a somewhat desperate situation. To illustrate, some time ago I had a debate with a professor at the University of California, Irvine, on the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, this man had written his doctoral dissertation on the subject and was thoroughly familiar with the evidence. And he could not deny the facts of Jesus' entombment, his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. And therefore, his only recourse was to come up with some alternative explanation of those four facts. And so, he argued that Jesus of Nazareth must have had an unknown, identical twin brother who was separated from him at birth, who came back to Jerusalem just at the time of the crucifixion, stole Jesus' body out of the tomb and presented himself to the disciples who mistakenly inferred that Jesus was risen from the dead. Now, I'm not going to go into how I went about refuting his theory, uh, but I think that the theory is instructive because it shows to what desperate lengths skepticism must go in order to deny the historicity of Jesus' resurrection. In fact, did you know that the evidence is so powerful that one of the world's leading Jewish theologians, Jewish theologians, the late Pincus Lapid, who taught at Hebrew University in Tel Aviv, declared himself convinced on the basis of the evidence that the God of Israel raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. So in summary then, the Gospels are not only trustworthy documents in general, but as we look at some of the most important facets of Jesus in the Gospels, like his radical personal claims, his miracles and exorcisms, his trial and crucifixion, and his resurrection from the dead, their historical veracity shines through. God has acted in history, and we can know it. Thank you very much.